director and general editor of the Thomas A. Edison papers in Rutgers. Um, in thinking about Edison, especially about New Jersey and Edison, there are a number of things which I'm sure all of you are very familiar with uh, being uh, New Jerseyans. Uh, obviously, there's Edison, New Jersey, the town in Middlesex County, which was named, I learned just uh, tonight, that was uh, not named until 1954, Edison, New Jersey. There's Edison National Historic Site, which I have visited in the past, and, and this is a brochure coming from the National Park Service. And if, if you haven't been to that, uh, that site, it's an excellent site. And I'm right, and to... hopefully they'll reopen before too much longer. Okay, it's closed. Right they've now. been renovating for quite a while now. The uh, Edison Labs are in, uh, in, in West Orange, I believe, and, and his home is in Llewellyn Park, and both of those should be ultimately open. The, the, the home is open. The lab is still being renovated. Uh, I learned also today that there's an Edison College in southwest Florida that began in 1962. And, of course, I think most of you know that there's Thomas Edison State College, which is a distance learning institution uh, headquartered right here in, in Trenton. And um, perhaps best known to all of us who drive on the New Jersey Turnpike, there's even an Edison Service Center between ex exits 11 and 12. So Edison is all around, and we're going to hear a lot about it, uh, about him and, and his work. At any rate, with, uh, going on with the introduction, uh, Dr. Israel has made the study of American invention and innovation his specialty. He's a former Californian. He came to the East more than 20 years ago to do research on a book on Thomas Edison and the electric light. After he joined the staff of the Edison Papers, he earned his PhD in history. And today, he is the director and general editor of the Thomas Edison Papers at Rutgers State University. These papers provide leadership in publishing and developing the documentary legacy of America's most prolific innovator and inventor. To date, the project has produced five volumes of the papers of Thomas Edison, as well as an online edition with over 165,000 uh, different uh, images, more than we have tonight. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> many more. <laughs> A couple of years ago, the Edison papers received the special retrospective Eugene Ferguson Prize from the Society for the History of Technology. And in 2000, the same society awarded Dr. Israel a prestigious Dexter Prize for his book, Edison, The Life of Invention. He has two other books, From Machine Shop to Industrial Laboratory, Technology and the Changing Context of American Invention, and Edison's Electric Light. In addition to these three books, Dr. Israel has been a frequent consultant uh, to the Edison National Historic Site, the National Museum of American History, the Smithsonian Institution, and even uh, helping to produce a documentary called Edison on the A&E cable uh, channel. Currently, his work is uh, in the connections between technology and, and intellectual property, and he still teaches the occasional graduate or undergraduate course in the history of technology. Please welcome me and, and welcoming Dr. Uh, Israel. Thank you. Um, I realize I need to, to update the bio slightly. Volume 6 of the Edison Papers just came out in September, so we're, we're moving along. Um, well, it, it's going to be interesting to see how this works this evening, since I have many pictures I was planning on showing you. Uh, pictures of Edison, pictures of laboratory notebooks, uh, other materials. So I'll uh, see how well my words can describe uh, some of this material. Um, I want to begin with, with Edison's death. Uh, he was lauded throughout the world when he died. World leaders wrote to the family, to the US government. Uh, major scientists um, talked about uh, Edison as the greatest inventor, somebody who had advanced the work of technology by a century. Um, he was also, however, seen as the last of his kind. And in the 
New York Times Magazine. Um, in October of 1931, um, a uh, long article by the then science editor, a fellow named Baldemir Camford, who had written a book on invention that included Edison, uh, described him thus. So it comes that he, about that he was the last and greatest of a long line of experimenters who followed only the dictates of their inner selves and who are as willful and unrestrained as poets. With him, the heroic age of invention probably ends. The future belongs to the organized, highly trained physicists and chemists of the Corporation Research Laboratory. And that same year, there was uh, a book published about the growth of industrial research. And the table that you don't see up, up above um, has a long list of all the various industries that had at least 75 or more industrial research laboratories in them. Uh, industrial laboratories grew dramatically during the 1920s. This was a phenomenon that grew out of World War I. Uh, they increased uh, considerably over the course of the 1930s and into the 1940s. And so the, sort of the modern style of industrial research corporations, or excuse me, industrial research laboratories within corporations became sort of a standard model for invention. Uh, and in fact, in these same years, um, court cases were heard in which judges were trying to determine, in fact, whether corporate research really fit the model that the patent system uh, was set up to uh, protect. Um, one of the problems was that it was seen that what corporations were doing was sort of routine experimentation. And the question was, was this invention? Right. More often than not, these are the step-by-step -step progress of an entire group, not the achievement of an individual. Um, such an advance is the product not of inventive ability, but of the financial resources and organizing ability of those who operate the laboratories. But the question was, could there be invention without inventive genius? Right. Um, in other words, patents were not intended as a reward for the collective achievement of corporate research, but for inventors, individual inventors. And in fact, in one case, the judge even argued that um, it would, should require an act of Congress to bring corporate invention into the patent system. Well, in fact, Congress decided that they didn't want to do that. So in fact, they specifically changed the Patent Act in 1952 to make it much easier for corporate invention to move forward. But what I want to talk about in this talk tonight is how Edison, who is seen as this heroic inventor, um, often seen as, as the last of the lone inventors, and we'll see very soon that that was not the case. Um, he was actually the first of the modern corporate R&D inventors, somebody who used science, who used laboratory resources, who in fact built the first R&D laboratory, uh, and developed a process of team research and invention that was very much in the style of, of modern R&D. Couple of those pictures. Uh, <laughs> I want to begin with Edison's youth. He grew up, he was born in Milan, Ohio, uh, moved to Port Huron, Michigan, about the age of seven. Uh, he grew up in a community that was very much a, um, a lumbering community. Uh, sawmills were common, the machinery of sawmills, and the machinery, most machinery in the 19th century, uh, if you look at pictures of it, a lot of gears and wheels, easy to see how the machinery moved. Right? And so a lot of the learning about technology took place merely from observation. Today we have computers. We can't really see what's going on inside them. This is true of so many of the things that are black boxes, like the system that we have to project. <laughs> um, but in Edison's day, a lot of the technology could readily be seen and understood. Um, and so Edison was surrounded by this kind of technology. However, there was a new technology that was just beginning to emerge. Um, this was telegraphy, the first electrical technology. Um, Edison was familiar with the telegraph. It came to Ohio in 1847, the same year that he was born. Uh, in his hometown in Port Huron, there was a telegraph line that came into the drugstore. A fellow worked uh, on that line uh, part time. Edison's first job when, as a telegrapher would, in fact, be in that same drugstore. Um, as you're probably aware, since this is one of the most commonly known things about Edison, he didn't attend much formal school. He seems to have attended a school briefly when the family moved to Port Huron, 
It's a little unclear as to exactly why he didn't continue to attend school. The story that's commonly told is the uh, teacher uh, told him he was addled. He went home, complained to his mother, uh, and she took him out of school. Um, the evidence seems to be that the family actually had some financial difficulties for a while, and she seems to have decided to teach him. Um, she, he learned through reading his father's library. Um, his father is usually ignored as a source of his education, but in fact, Sam Edison taught Edison a lot of things um, that Edison probably learned by, by looking at him, including entrepreneurial uh, skills. Uh, Sam Edison tried a whole bunch of different things over the course of his life, and Edison got to see him both fail and succeed, fail again and succeed. Um, this was an important lesson for Edison, who seems never to have feared failure, right? And so this was an important aspect of his career. So as a young boy, um, he was somebody who liked to experiment with things, take clocks apart. This is a kind of common theme when you talk even about modern inventors, people who like to take things apart and put it back together, see how they work. Edison was like that. He and a friend strung a telegraph line between their houses. He got a job on the Grand Trunk Railroad running between Port Huron and Detroit. He would stop at the offices of the telegraph, uh, excuse me, at the telegraph offices along the line, talk to the uh, operators. Um, he was beginning to become very interested in this new technology and how it worked. He saved the life of a, a young boy uh, who was the son of a telegrapher. A boxcar got free while the kid was playing in the train yard, and Edison pulled him uh, free. Um, he then gave Edison formal lessons, but Edison was already uh, beginning to learn about uh, telegraphy by that time. Um, and the telegraph represents the kind of invention that Edison um, found as he began to move in the world of telegraphy and into um, uh, becoming a, a full-time inventor. Samuel Morse, who was the inventor of the telegraph, was an artist. He did a lot of work sort of on his own in his studio uh, apartment in um, uh, New York University where he was teaching art. Uh, he took common elements, the canvas stretcher uh, for, from his painting, the type rule from his brother's printing uh, business, his brother printed a newspaper, and used these as common elements in his telegraph. Unfortunately, I don't have pictures, so it's a little hard to show you exactly what happened, but he drew on knowledge that he gained at the university uh, Leonard Gale, who was the chemist, taught him about batteries, introduced him to the work of Joseph Henry, who was uh, the leading American electrical experimenter and scientist of the day, uh, somebody working in the wake of uh, Michael Faraday, whose researches in electricity were the standard work on electricity at that time. Uh, Henry's experiments on electromagnets were central to Morse's ability to design a telegraph instrument. Uh, Gale's information and knowledge about batteries was crucial. Uh, just as important was a fellow named Alfred Vail, who was the son of a machinist who came to NYU. His father, Stephen Vail, ran the Speedwell Ironworks in Morristown, New Jersey. This was a very innovative ironworks. Uh, some of the work that went on there uh, was very important to the construction of the first uh, transatlantic steamship. So um, Vail had experience as a machinist, he took these crude instruments that Morse had designed at New York University um, and the knowledge about electromagnetism and batteries that they gained from, from Gale and Henry, and it's Vail who turned these into nice machined instruments could be used day after day in a, a telegraph uh, office. And this was really crucial to the inventive process, and this is very typical of what went on. Machine shops were the invention factories, the industrial laboratories of the 19th century. And it was skilled machinists like Alfred Vail who would take an idea that an inventor like Samuel Morse had and convert it from what was either just an idea or maybe a crude instrument like Morse had into a finished product that could be used uh, daily. Um, these instruments, as they then went out into the world, other machinists, machine shops, would then become the manufacturing centers for these things. So in Boston, for example, there were a number of scientific instrument makers. These were shops that were already doing work in electricity for college demonstrations and things like this, so they could easily uh, begin to make the new telegraph instruments. And in fact, some of them even published little manuals about electricity that went with their um, 
their instrument catalog. So this is the world that Edison came into as a young telegraph operator during the Civil War. Uh, he was uh, one of the many young men, really teenagers, who were hired to replace the older operators who were now in the military service. And so Edison traveled from Port Huron uh, throughout the Midwest, uh, operating telegraph lines uh, throughout um, the period of the Civil War and immediately after. Uh, he learned a lot in the process. Unlike many of the operators who like to spend their free hours drinking and gambling, uh, Edison did not do those things. Instead, he spent his free hours studying the telegraph, reading Faraday's experimental researches, uh, reading other works on electricity and magnetism, on science, um, looking at the instruments, thinking about how he could improve them. And we have drawings of his from the mid-1860s where he's we can see him taking designs of instruments that are in the office and thinking about how to modify them. In 1867, um, Edison begins to really take on the idea of becoming an inventor. This is while he's in Cincinnati. Um, and we can begin to see him, as I say, sketching out his ideas for new inventions, but it's the next year, in 1868, when he gets to Boston, that he really then transforms himself into inventor. Because what Boston has is something that Cincinnati doesn't have and a lot of these other Midwest towns don't have. And this is a flourishing center of telegraph manufacturing. One of the first things Edison does when he gets to Boston is he goes from shop to shop and investigates what's going on in each of them. And in fact, he writes an article for the telegrapher, which is sort of a combination of trade journal, uh, sort of gossip magazine for telegraphers. Um, and he describes each of the shops, what kind of work is going on in them, what inventive activity is taking place. One of the premier shops is Charles Williams Jr. shop uh, on Court Street. And there's a fellow named Moses Farmer. Anybody ever heard of him? How about the fire alarm, the city fire alarm telegraph? Well, he's one of the co-inventors of that, but nobody's ever heard of him. Uh, he co-invents that in 1851. Well, he's one of the people working in space, in a space that's assigned to him in uh, William's shop to do some experimental work. And he's got machinists that he has helping him. Uh, Edison gets some space in William's shop to carry out some of his experiments. Later on, there's another inventor who walks in and he finds a machinist named Thomas Watson. Uh, name, sound familiar name, buddy? Who is he? Alexander Graham Bell's assistant. That's how Bell came to know Watson. He was an experimental machinist in uh, William Shaw. So this was a really important center for inventive activity, and Edison learned a lot. His first patented invention is a vote recorder. Now, it's not for public votes. It's for legislators. Uh, so they can sit at their desks, flip a switch, and vote yes or no. And Edison tried to interest uh, a number of, of uh, legislatures in this. There's a story told that he went down to Washington, tried to interest Congress, was told by the uh, chairman of the committee that he took it to that they didn't want anything like that there. And the reason for that, of course, is they didn't want to vote very fast. They wanted to take their time. They wanted to make deals, right, as the voting went on so that they could uh, pass legislation. Uh, so Edison learned a valuable lesson. Um, and this is one of the few inventions that he had that he wasn't able to commercialize in some sense. Um, he had another invention that was going to send two messages simultaneously on one wire. And there were a lot of people working on this kind of technology. Um, and so he goes down to New York to experiment uh, on that system with the fellow who had just given up the job as editor of the telegrapher. And he gets down there and he realizes he's got a problem with one of his instruments. He takes it to a shop. Now, at William's shop, he was well known. He could walk in and have a modification made. Instead, he wrote to his backer back in, in Boston, what delays me here is awaiting the alteration of my instruments on account of the piling up of jobs at the instrument makers. He had to wait in line. And this was a really important lesson for Edison. Um, one of the other inventions that he devised in Boston was a, a form of stock ticker. Now, Edison did not invent the stock ticker, as is commonly told. A fellow named Edward Callahan, who I'm sure nobody has ever heard of, invented that in 1867. And a company was formed, Golden Stock Telegraph Company, 
to market this new technology. Well, there were other companies that were set up, and Edison set up a little company himself in Boston to provide uh, quotes uh, on the, uh, the little instrument that he devised. Um, and then he went down, as I say, to New York with this other instrument. Um, the experiments didn't go terribly well, but fortunately for him, Pope had decided that he didn't want to continue working for a competitor of Golden Stock, and Edison took his job as superintendent. Didn't last very long, Golden Stock bought out the Law's uh, gold reporting company, and so Edison was out of a job, although he and Pope briefly uh, joined in a kind of partnership uh, trying to uh, develop other uh, printing telegraphs for use uh, as private lines. There were no telephones, so if you had a shop downtown and your factory was a ways away and you wanted to get material delivered, you used a telegraph instead. And so there were ways they were trying to devise telegraphs to make them easier to use. Well, the fellow who ran Golden Stock Telegraph, Marshall Lefferts, was a very clever fellow. And he realized that um, if he could control inventors and their patents, that he could dominate the market for stock and other market reporting technology. And he did just that. Uh, and amongst the inventors that they decided to bring into the company through contract as a contract inventor, was this young fellow, Thomas Edison, who showed a lot of promise with the work that he had already done on printing telegraphs. Edison signs two contracts with them, and one of those contracts calls for him to uh, have enough money to um, set up a little shop, and he could hire a machinist to do his experimental work. Edison hooks up with this guy named William Unger, who's a machinist in Newark, and instead of just setting up a little experimental shop, they set up the Newark Telegraph Works. And what they plan on doing is, in fact, manufacturing the instruments that, they're going to, that Edison is going to invent for um, Golden Stock. And so uh, Edison uh, soon has a very flourishing uh, telegraph manufacturing concern. Uh, in fact, at one point in Newark, he had five different shops going because he was working not just for Golden Stock, but also ultimately doing some work for Western Union in a couple of years and for another company known as Automatic Telegraph, which was a competitor to Western Union. And so Edison had a lot going on all at once, and he had a big crew of machinists, some of whom were very highly skilled machinists, including a fellow named Charles Batchelor, who would soon become his chief experimental assistant and would remain that uh, into the uh, 1890s. Um, Edison is not the only inventor doing this. A fellow named Alicia Gray, anybody ever heard of him? He filed a kind of preliminary patent known as a caveat in the patent office the same day Alexander Bell, Bell filed his patent uh, that included the telephone. And Gray's caveat included a device that could be a telephone. Um, so he's actually sort of co-inventing the telephone at the same time Gray, uh, excuse me, Bell is. Nobody's ever heard of him. Never heard of Western Electric. Okay, that started out as a firm known as Barton and Gray. Barton was a manufacturer. Gray was the inventor. A fellow named Anson Steger, who was the Midwestern superintendent uh, of um, Western Union, bought an interest on behalf of Western Union in this company and changed the name to Western Electric. Later on, when the Western Union telephone interest was sold to the Bell Company, they also sold a firm known as Western Electric, which then became the manufacturing arm of the Bell Company and then later AT&T. So all this grows out of the telegraph, as did the telephone itself. Um, William Morton, who's president of Western Union, realizes that all of these market reporting uh, lines that are being built for the gold exchange, the stock exchange, the oil, the produce, the cotton exchange, uh, all of these are providing commercial information that would be very valuable to a competitor to Western Union. And so in order to prevent this from happening, he buys up golden stock so he can control the commercial news. Because Western Union has a flourishing commercial news department. You know who's in charge of that? A fellow named Marshall Lefferts. A little conflict of interest, but that seemed not to trouble anybody at the time. Um, this is in May of 1871. When that merger happens, a new contract is signed with Thomas Edison. A five-year contract to be an inventor for Golden Stock. Um, and Edison, by this time, is becoming a more knowledgeable inventor. He actually sets up different notebooks, one for Golden Stock, one for the automatic telegraph company, one for another automatic system he's going to design himself, 
uh, and another one for things that he's going to invent on his own and not for any capitalists. Right? So here's Edison. He's working on printing telegraphy. He's working on this automatic telegraph system. Now, the automatic uh, uses punch paper tape. And as the tape with the punches, uh, the holes punched goes over a, a metal wheel, uh, there's a little contact that makes contact with the metal whenever a hole goes through and sends an electrical signal out over the line. At the other end, paper that's been impregnated with chemicals uh, is taken through a little uh, recording device. And every time a signal goes through a little stylus, right, it sends a, discharges electricity through and discolors the paper, leaving marks, dots and dashes. And this is a much faster system, but there are all sorts of technical problems that Edison's trying to, to solve for the automatic company. Well, Western Union has what they think is a better system for their um, uh, internet, or excuse me, their national uh, lines. Western Union is the first national company in the United States, right? Coast to coast company. One of the things about Western Union's messages, there are two principal types of messages that get sent on Western Union lines. Short business messages, often 10 words or less, uh, and then the associated press wire. Edison, in fact, as an operator, took associated press wire, and that's why he developed this very nice handwriting you're not seeing up above. Um, but, and so the automatic was well designed for long messages like A&P messages, but not so good for those short messages. Because in order to have that speedy transmission uh, of uh, the automatic work well, you needed to collect together all those short messages so you could actually send a long message really quickly. Otherwise, an operator would be faster, actually. So Edison's working on these competing systems. And, um, Remember that system to send two messages simultaneously? Well, somebody beat him to it, a guy named Joseph Stearns, who'd been up in Boston. Um, he sells it to Western Union in 1872. And Edison walks into Wharton's office with a bunch of drawings and says, hey, I can invent all sorts of other alternative duplexes. And Wharton realizes immediately that he needs to have Edison do just that in order to protect the Stearns patent and prevent other inventors from inventing around the technology that Western Union is using. Now, why is the duplex so important? The most costly part of the line, or the system, are the lines. Right? All those wires have to be strung across the country and kept in repair. So if you can send two messages on one wire, you can reduce the number of messages. Edison further improves the system. He invents something called the quadruplex, four messages, two in each direction. This is a huge cost savings for Western Union. Um, and so Edison really, by this time, has earned a, a reputation as one of the key inventors in the telegraph industry. He's still trying to develop this automatic that competes with Western Union, even as he's working for Western Union. But they're also hoping to market this overseas, because it's overseas where uh, much longer messages are being sent, especially government reports and things like that. Um, and so the idea that they have is that if they can begin to get uh, foreign governments interested in this technology, maybe uh, that will help it to take off. He, they send Edison to England in May and June of 1873. And he goes over there uh, and experiments with his instruments. There are two problems. First of all, uh, England has a lot of its lines coming into the cities underground. And this creates electrical effects that retard the signal and make it much harder to transmit uh, quickly with this uh, instrument. They're also concerned about the quality of the recording, whether that chemically uh, treated paper is, really gives a permanent record. And then finally, they try to experiment on the Atlantic cables. Britain basically runs most of the underseas cables in the world at this point. And so the Greenwich Cable Works, where the, all the cables are manufactured, Edison goes and experiments with the coiled cable. And he sends a signal, and a little dash turns out to be 24 feet long. <laughs> That's not going to work. So he realizes immediately he doesn't understand anything about the undersea cables. He goes back to the US. In fact, even before he gets back, he begins experimenting or drawing up experiments that he's going to do with, with cable telegraphy. Well, let me read to you um, something that kind of describes the difference between what was the American experience where the lines were overhead, and except for the occasional thunderstorm, you didn't really have a lot of 
problems that, that uh, really presented themselves like the underground lines and the undersea cables did. Um, William Priest, who heads the British uh, postal telegraph system, writes an article called, called Scientific Telegraphy. And he says, in the US, the absence of submarine cables, underground wires, and complicated apparatus require less attention to the abstruse laws of electricity than has been the case in England. At home, the intricate laws of induction have not only called forth the closest attention and study of the telegraph engineer, but the operations and researches of the engineer have materially advanced our knowledge of the science itself. Many new laws and striking facts have emanated from the practical telegraphist. Hence, the English telegraph engineer has become essentially a scientific man. And strikingly, probably the leading physicist of the day, Lord Kelvin, Sir William Thompson, was not only a brilliant physicist, but in fact, he was a major um, figure in the telegraph industry. He invented a lot of the technology that was used on the submarine cables, and he invented a lot of the electrical measuring instruments that were used to maintain the system. So we can see now a very close relationship between the telegraph system in England and uh, the scientific community. The same was not true in the US. And one of the things that Edison found in England was not just a more sort of scientifically aware uh, telegraph community, but one that was much better equipped, all sorts of scientific instruments, measuring instruments, and other things that he realized he needed for his own research. So Edison comes back. He does experiments in chemistry for the recording process. He buys a number of scientific uh, instruments from Elliott Brothers, one of the leading manufacturers in London. He also begins to experiment on cables. And in fact, he packs tubes full of carbon, which has very high resistance, um, kind of powdered carbon, um, in order to replicate the, the high resistance to the current on the undersea cables that resist the movement of the, the electricity through the line and thus the induction that retards the, the signal to try and understand how that operates. Um, the problem is, He's working in a machine shop, and every time the machinery is in use, it shakes the tubes, and the loud noise further causes the, the carbon to kind of bounce up and down, and the resistance varies wildly. So it's very hard for him to do his experiments. Um, so he finally gives that up, but we'll, we'll see. He actually comes back to that, that experiment. The other thing that Edison does is basic research. We don't think of Edison as doing basic research, but one of the things as he's experimenting with all of this telegraph technology, discovers that one of the laws of electromagnetism is the charge and discharge is in proportion to the length of the iron core, right? That the wire is wrapped around. The why and wherefore of this is the cause I've been unable to glean from any investiga investigations heretofore published that have come to my notice. I was led from this want of data to undertake a series of investigations with the view of learning, if possible, the causes of some of the phenomena noticed by different investigations and described in works upon electricity. And we have his notebooks filled with these kind of experiments on electromagnets. He experimented with very long electromagnets, and we see some of those in his cable telegraph and duplex experiments. And he experimented on short core magnets. And this was actually a central uh, development for uh, his quadruplex telegraph that used a short core magnet. And this grew out of all these researches he did. Edison probably had the most sophisticated series of experiments on electromagnets that anybody had done since Joseph Henry, but he didn't publish them. The quote I read is actually from an introduction to a book he was going to write on telegraphy that included a lot of his experiments, but he never did publish it. We just have some of his notes. So by so the, Edison gets back in June of 1873. On December 1, 1873, this is what he writes to a friend of his, a fellow inventor, would be happy to give the Sun Recorder, this is this fellow's device, a test in my laboratory at Newark. I have every conceivable variety of electric apparatus and any quantity of chemicals for experimentation. So within a very short time, Edison had moved from mainly just having a shop to actually having a full-fledged electrical and chemical laboratory. It was still just part of the shop, but it was much bigger than anybody else had at the time. Western Electric did have a small lab um, in a corner of their machine shop, uh, and it's even described in the... Um, in one of their catalogs, the laboratory is located in the third story and has ample accommodations for electrical, chemical, and scientific investigations, but it wasn't nearly as large as what Edison had by this time. Um, so this is in 1873. In 1874, he does a lot of experimental work of one sort or another on these various systems. 
He devises the quadruplex telegraph that year. And then there's a big dispute over who owns it because Western Union never put him under formal contract. And Edison was faced with financial uh, difficulties because of a depression uh, going on in the country. He ends up selling the rights to his quadruplex, his rights, to a fellow named Jay Gould, who also happened to buy at the same time the automatic telegraph company. And so Gould suddenly owned all of Edison's telegraph inventions, or at least claimed that he did. And there's a big court battle that goes on between Western Union and and uh, Gould over this. In the meantime, Edison sort of separates himself out of this battle, decides he's going to set up his own separate laboratory, he takes the four-story building that's his shop, cuts it in half, essentially, takes the upper floors for his laboratory, the lower floors are taken by the uh, existing shop, and his then partner, Joseph Murray, continues to operate it. Edison um, draws up a long list. He and Bachelor draw up a long list of the things that they're going to try to develop out of this laboratory. And he actually develops one commercial device. Anybody ever heard of the electric pen? No. The electric pen, little pen with a little motor on top. The motor drives the needle up and down. You write and create a stencil. And then you squeegee ink through it. Does that sound like anything familiar? Like the mimeograph? This is the forerunner of the mimeograph. And in fact, Edison devises another form that's basically just a, a slate board with pins sticking up, when, and you write with a blunt instrument, and that creates a stencil. A.B. Dick buys that patent and gets Edison's help, and he markets not the A.B. Dick mimeograph, but the Edison mimeograph. So the first mimeograph marketed by A.B. Dick was actually the Edison mimeograph, and it grew out of this technology that Edison was working on in the middle of 1875. They do a lot of other experiments, but this is the only thing they really uh, have any success with. There are a number of them sold. Lewis Carroll was amongst the people who purchased an electric pen. You've seen his diaries writing about using the electric pen. Um, Edison ended up selling the rights. He manufactured it for himself for a while, but then ended up selling the manufacturing rights to Western Electric and got out of that business. And instead, he decided to move to a little uh, community in central New Jersey called Menlo Park. Menlo Park was a failed housing development. There was a home that was sort of, I guess, the model home on the lot. Um, that was pretty much all that was there. And with his father's help, uh, he put up a laboratory. His father came out from, from Port Huron and, and supervised the construction of a laboratory, 25 by 100 feet long, uh, two stories. Uh, the back of it was a small machine shop. The upper floor was an electrical and chemical laboratory. He brought out with him um, about five of his experimental assistants, two machinists, uh, three uh, experimenters. Um, and the machine shop itself cost him about $100 a week to run. So. He writes a letter to William Orton. He talks about you know, how now he has this laboratory for experimentation. Uh, he knows that, that Orton is interested in, in having him uh, continue to do uh, work for the company. Uh, Orton wants to bring him back into the fold. They're also concerned about this new uh, telegraphic device known as a telephone that Alexander Graham Bell had exhibited in the summer of 1876 at um, uh, the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia. So in March of 1877, they sign a new contract that provides Edison $100 a week to run his laboratory. So the machine shop is actually being paid for by Western Union. And what they get in exchange is all of Edison's inventions applicable to landline telegraphy, including, of course, the telephone, if in fact Edison can prove on the Bell telephone. Well, you remember those test tubes full of the carbon that the resistance kept changing? Well, if you're trying to, of course, get the changing sound waves of the voice to change an electrical signal, that's actually a pretty good idea, that varying resistance. And so Edison, in fact, uses carbon. He develops a thing known as a carbon button. They actually burn kerosene lamps night and day. They cut a, a V in the, in the wick so that it actually uh, causes more of the lamp black to adhere to the chimney, and then they scrape that off, and they come up with a little solution that they can mold into these buttons. And for Western Union, Edison develops the carbon transmitter, which actually makes the Bell telephone a more commercial instrument because you can hear better over longer distance with Edison's carbon transmitter. This becomes a really important 
uh, improvement in the technology. Later, in the mid-1880s, Edison actually goes to work as a contract inventor for the Bell Company and further improves the carbon transmitter, and that became the standard transmitter that everybody used until we all began using digital telephones. In fact, if you find an old-fashioned telephone and unscrew the transmitting part, you'll find a little carbon button in there. So this is Edison's uh, important contribution to telephone technology. Um, that's not the only thing that comes out of his telephone research, because in 1877, there are no switchboards. So how do you use a telephone? You use it like a telegraph, right? You have operators take messages. And so if you want a recorded message, then you have to find some way to record it. And of course, the signal will only transmit about 250 miles. So if you want to transmit longer than that, you need some way of repeating the signal, just like a telegraph. Edison comes up with an idea. And one evening, uh, as he's working on the telephone, he attaches a needle to a diaphragm, speaks into the diaphragm as he's drawing wax paper under, and gets an embossed um, embossing from the sound waves on the wax paper. Now, he hasn't heard anything yet, right? But he says, there is no doubt I shall be able to store up and reproduce automatically in any future time the human voice perfectly. This is a pretty confident guy. Uh, and in fact, within six months, less than six months, beginning in December of 1877, he had the phonograph, the first device to ever record and play back sound. He becomes the Wizard of Menlo Park. One reason it was so uh, astounding to people is that the leading uh, physicist of the day working on acoustics, a fellow named Hermann von Helmholtz, was using uh, basically a, a device that was a tuning fork with an electromagnet to vibrate it to um, produce a single vowel sound. Right? You can imagine if that's what you're doing to reproduce a single vowel sound, what you might have to do to even have the simplest word. And here's this fellow who comes along. This instrument is basically just like a lathe. It's a cylinder right, with a, a diaphragm with a little needle. And you speak into it as you're turning it. And this creates a sound recording. It just astounded people. A fellow at the Stevens Institute, Alfred Mayer, uh, took a journey to, to Menlo Park on his return. He says, ever since my return home, your marvelous invention has so occupied my brain that I can hardly collect my thoughts but carry on my work. The results are far-reaching in science. Its capabilities are immense. I cannot express my admiration for your genius better than by frankly saying that I would rather be the discoverer of your talking machine than to have made the first best discovery of anyone who's worked in acoustics. So here's Edison, this very talented inventor, astounding the scientific world. Right? Um, and he astounds the people that he's working with as well. And pretty soon, although he's, he's having a lot of trouble commercializing the phonograph, and in fact, it's the Bell Company, a number of individuals of the Bell Company that tried to set up the Edison Speaking Phonograph Company to uh, fund his work, but he doesn't really succeed at that point. Um, within a few months, he sort of decided he doesn't want to continue working on the phonograph. He's more attracted to a new technology. Uh, for the first time, city streets are beginning to be lit by brilliant electric lights, known as arc lights. Two carbon rods separated by a little space, you send an uh, electrical current through them, and a big spark gap appears that creates a brilliant light. People are thinking, wow, this is wonderful, but it doesn't really work for most indoor spaces. So we need to figure out a way to subdivide it. And there have been people working on electric lighting for a long time, little incandescent lights going back to Humphrey Davy, um, you know, over 40 years. Um, Edison decides this is what he's going to do. He announces in the press that he's figured out a solution. And the first thing that happens is a number of people involved with Western Union decide they're going to set up a company. And pretty soon, the Edison Electric Light Company is established. The first president is the then president of Western Union, a guy named Norvin Green. Um, amongst the people who acquire an interest in Edison's British patents is uh, J.P. Morgan and other people connected with the Drexel Morgan Banking Company. Uh, Morgan also was interested in Western Union. Uh, over a period of about two and a half years, the research and development period, they spent about $130,000. Doesn't sound like a lot. Today, it would be about $2.3 million. That sounds like more, but you know, for a complete startup from scratch for an entirely new technical system, it doesn't seem like a lot. But in those days, there was nothing comparable. Nobody had ever done that before. I mean, it's really astounding. Um, Edison soon expands his laboratory, builds a new two-story office and uh, library. 
And in the front of the uh, complex and in the back, he builds a large machine shop so they can build dynamos and other things like that. He hires new assistants. Um, Francis Upton, who went to Princeton to get his master's in science after studying at Bowdoin uh, BA, and goes to study with Hermann von Helmholtz. He never does get his PhD, uh, but when he returns to working for Edison, he realizes that Edison knows more about what's going on with electricity and electric lighting than Hermann von Helmholtz, with whom he studied in Berlin. Two chemists trained as PhDs in German universities, Otto Moses and Alfred Haid. Um, a fellow named Ludwig Bohm, who worked for the Geisler Company. This was a scientific instrument company that did a lot of work on vacuum pumps and glow lamps for experimental purposes. Right? So these new sort of scientific workers come in and join the machinists working in the laboratory. Uh, Edison, at that time, probably has a better understanding of the basic electrical laws of uh, electric light subdivision than the leading scientists of the day, because they're looking at what he's doing and not understanding it. And it was only later, after he had succeeded, that they realized that he had understood how to apply those laws to a technical system, right? And that's the key, right? Transforming those laws into something that could be used in a technical system. This was something that Edison was able to do that the leading electricians of the day, or electrical scientists of the day, were unable to do. Edison begins where a lot of people had begun. There were two ways to do electric lights. You either took carbon, like a charred uh, piece of paper, put it in a vacuum, and lit it up, uh, put, a, put a electricity through it till it, it glowed. The problem was that the, most of the vacuums weren't very good and the carbon would disintegrate. Or he used a metal with a high melting point. And at that time, the highest, uh, the, the best metal to use, um, tungsten, which had a higher melting point, could not yet be drawn into wire. One of the keys when GE sets up its laboratory in the first decade of the 20th century is to figure out a way to draw tungsten into wire. So the modern light bulb uses tungsten. Um, Edison uh, tried using platinum. Now, platinum is a pretty expensive, rare material, right? But it had the highest melting point, uh, and Edison realizes this. Um, but one of the problems with his experiments was that it kept melting sooner than it should have. So he decides, I'm going to figure this out. So he does some basic research again. He takes his metal wire, he puts it under the conditions of incandescent, and then he looks at it under a microscope, he sees air bubbles. It's absorbing hydrogen from the atmosphere, it turns out. Well, he realizes the solution to that is to put it in a vacuum. But he also knows that there's a problem with vacuum technology as it exists. That's why he hires Bohm and begins building vacuum pumps at the laboratory in order to improve the vacuum in these metal lamps. It's to protect the platinum. And he discovers as he's, draw as he's bringing it up to vacuum, that if he drives out the gases by heating the metal, then in fact it raises the melting point. And in fact, he reports on this to the American Association for the Advancement of Science in August of 1879 as he's developing this much improved lamp. Um, at the same time, Edison is working on generators. Now, generators are a lot different from these small little telegraph devices with their little electromagnets. They have big electromagnets, right? So Edison, now faced with this new technology he doesn't know a lot about, does the same thing. He does all these investigations into electromagnets and electromagnetism, but now a much larger scale. And they begin to build generators. And in fact, by May of 1879, Edison still doesn't have a commercial lamp. He's got a commercial generator. Right? This is something that's little known, is that Edison, in fact, invents his generator before he invents his, his light. And one of the keys to what Edison was doing was he conceptualized the system. Right? Not just a light. And he had the resources. And that's what's so different between Edison and everybody else working on the problem. He could do all these things simultaneously. Right? He could assign different people to different parts of the task. By October of 1879, Edison has a lamp that works really well except for one thing. Part of what he needs for this electrical system that, that's based on these laws is a high resistance lamp. Uh, resistance is measured in ohms. He's getting uh, lamps of about 10 ohms. He wants 100 ohms or more. So he has a long ways to go. And he's got these very compli complicated regulators he's trying to devise that will simulate a 100 ohm lamp in the system. Um, and then one day, um, Edison is sitting around with one of those carbon buttons, because they're still manufacturing them for commercial use at the laboratory. 
He starts rolling it between his fingers and takes a look after a while and realizes that he's got kind of like a wire, right? Carbonized wire. So they try turning them into spirals because he thought that if you had a spiral filament that more heat would be contained within the spiral and you'd use less energy, right, to heat the lamp. Um, but they kept breaking. And probably Charles Batchelor, I'm betting Batchelor was the one that suggested this, because Batchelor installed the Clark thread mills in Elizabeth, New Jersey, before he went to work for Edison. They try a piece of thread, and they just loop it into the lamp, evacuate it, and on October 22, 1.30 in the morning, they start burning this thing. And 13 hours later, it's still going. It's over 100 ohms, 113 ohms. Then they crank it way up to see what happens. It burns for a couple hours, and then the glass breaks. But they realize now they're suddenly on the right track. And pretty soon, they're doing a lot of experiments on um, different carbonized materials. Initially, just anything that happens to be laying around. But pretty soon, he sends Otto Moses, his chemist, into the library. And he reads through all the literature to figure out what kind of materials would work best. And they soon realize that long, tall grasses, because they have long, contiguous fibers, right? so that when you carbonize them, bend them and carbonize them, they're going to be sturdier. And pretty soon, Edison realizes that bamboo right, is what he needs. Well, by this time, Edison has not only um, got this research project on the lamp and on different kinds of filament materials, but he's expanded his staff at the beginning of 1880. So there are, it goes from about, when he begins, about a dozen to about 20 to about 50 people in 1880 all working on different aspects of the system. So he's got people working on uh, lamp filaments, on how you attach the filament to the lead-in wires, on the vacuum, on meters, underground lines, because he's going to put his system underground to replicate the gas light systems in cities, his generator improvements, um, sockets. Right? You have an electric light, how are you going to hold it in? And so the socket is invented at Menlo Park, as is the safety fuse, which turns out to be really important for commercial reasons because the Board of Fire Underwriters then gives approval to the electrical system. In the meantime, um, uh, Charles Young and Charles Brackett from Princeton, two scientists, come to Menlo Park to investigate the uh, efficiency of the generator. And George Barker from the University of Pennsylvania and Henry Rowland from Johns Hopkins come and do investigations on the efficiency of the light. These are things that the scientific community is interested in. And in fact, in 1880, there was a new journal called Science. And guess who the first publisher was? Thomas Edison. But he didn't really want to keep spending his money on this journal, uh, so he gave it up. And a couple years later, it was restarted by another inventor, a guy named Alexander Graham Bell. And uh, the fellow he hired, a, he hired a biologist as the editor, and this guy wrote in 1883, becoming restive at the slow progress of discovery, the inventor has himself, has himself assumed the role of investigator, and the results of his researches appear in the records of the patent office. In consequence, this, consequence the discoveries upon which many of the most important scientific investigations of the day rest will be searched for in vain in the scientific literature. The telegraph, the telephone, and the electric light are inventions which illustrate the fact now stated. Now, what's interesting is that same year, Henry Rowland, who'd been at Menlo Park studying electric lights, uh, is the president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And in his presidential address, he pleads for pure science. That's the title of it, plea for pure science. And he asks, what must be done to create a science of physics in this country rather than to call telegraphs, electric lights, and such conveniences by the name of science. One of the things that Roland had discovered is Thomas Edison had a pretty good laboratory, and at Johns Hopkins, which was the first PhD institution in the country, he didn't. Right? So where was the support for science coming from? And he wanted to be in the universities, not in Edison's research laboratory. So Edison and his crew eventually developed this technology they move it to commercialization in 1881. Uh, in uh, September of 1882, 125 years ago, the Pearl Street Station opens in New York. Um, but even more importantly, buildings like this one would have had their own independent generator and lighting system. 
isolated plants were all over the place. Edison actually had to set up a whole separate company to convince his investors that central stations made good economic sense because they were expensive to build. Actually, the Pearl Street Station cost more than twice as much what the original research and development on the electric light had cost uh, and involved many more experiments. But the development of the lighting system did several things. First, it taught Edison about research and development. Because it's really at this period that Edison moves from having a laboratory to having a true research and development laboratory. Also teaches about innovation, how to take a technology from idea into the marketplace. And Edison is a central figure in doing that. And it taught other people the value of these research laboratories. So Henry Rowland, wanting something similar for Johns Hopkins, is arguing for science as the source of new technology. Um, the Bell Company sets up what's known as its mechanical department. And if you could see the picture, you would see it replicates in many ways the images that we have of Menlo Park. Uh, Edward Weston, who's one of the many people building generators at this time, involved in uh, arc lighting as well, uh, he sets up a new laboratory in Newark, New Jersey. His firm actually becomes the standard bearer for the development of electrical measuring technology. Uh, those of you who used to use meters, you know, external meters for your cameras may remember Weston Meters. Well, that's the company. Uh, the records of the Weston company, or at least Weston's own personal records, are actually at NGIT now. He built this laboratory in Newark, New Jersey in 1885, and it was a much grander laboratory than what Edison had had at Menlo Park. And Edison, by this time, was based in New York, and his labs were in the various manufacturing companies. He didn't have his own private laboratory anymore. So in 1887, Edison decides he's going to build the grandest laboratory anybody's ever seen. And that's what he builds at West Orange. Um, he writes to one of the people he's trying to interest in supporting this um, laboratory that he will be able to build every, anything from a lady's watch to, an electric, to, a, to a, a locomotive. And he could literally do that. There are two machine shops, a huge machine shop downstairs, a small precision machine shop upstairs. There's a two-story library. There's a, four outbuildings, each of which is the same size as a single story of the Menlo Park Laboratory. And those are the outbuildings, not the main building. There's a chemical laboratory, an electrical laboratory, a metallurgical laboratory. Uh, Edison has his own private experimental space upstairs. Um, he is unable to interest other people in investing in his laboratory, so what he ends up doing is, in fact, going back to the Edison Electric Light companies and saying, I will be your industrial research laboratory, and I'm going to charge you this much a month for the research and for charge you additional for materials and other things like that. And they agree, because they want and need sort of continued innovation. And so Edison's... West Orange Laboratory is, in many respects, the first corporate R&D lab, right? And at the same time, of course, as Thomas Edison, he can't work on one thing at a time. So in 1885, Alexander Graham Bell and a fellow named Charles Sumner Tainer had realized that if they took Edison's phonograph, which used heavy metal foil known as tinfoil to record on, and instead put wax on it, that they got a better recording. So they invent wax-recorded cylinders on what they call their graphophone, which is phonograph backwards. Um, and, and they wanted to interest Edison in their work. And they actually asked him if he would be interested in joining them and merging their interests. But for Edison, the phonograph was his baby. He literally says this in one of his interviews, that it's my baby and it will uh, you know, uh, keep me uh, busy in, in old age and, and uh, uh, support me. Um, so he goes into this new research laboratory, and he now has the facilities to really take this technology and commercialize it, to make improved uh, phonographs, improved wax recording. Uh, they do thousands of experiments on wax materials to find the best material for uh, the cylinders. This is something that Bell can't afford to do. He doesn't have the same resources. At the same time, Edison's doing all this work for the Edison Electric Light Company and also working on this side project that will eventually consume a decade in northern New Jersey for uh, separating low-grade iron ore. Uh, all this at the same time, and this is how Edison tended to operate. Um, but he took the lessons that he had learned from the period of Menlo Park and the period of doing research and development and innovation in electric lighting and transformed uh, not just the electrical industry or created the electrical industry, but 
at West Orange. He took the, phone, the crude phonograph, turned that into the sound recording industry. He took ideas that had been circulating about motion pictures and created the first motion picture company, although there were other people simultaneously working on that as well. He begins working at the beginning of the 20th century on electric storage batteries for automobiles. He actually comes up with a relatively successful battery, but it takes him a decade to do that. In the meantime, Henry Ford had just figured out a way to mass produce uh, internal combustion automobiles, and the price dropped, right? Um, but Edison's batteries were actually used in all sorts of industrial purposes. His mining venture in uh, northern New Jersey fails because the price of ore drops when the big Mesabi range is discovered in the Midwest. He Edison had figured out a way to electromagnetically separate iron ore by crushing the rock that the low-grade ore was in and separating it with the electromagnets pulling off the magnetic iron as the sand fell. And then he had a way of, of uh, combining that into material called muck and creating these briquettes that could be tossed into steel mills. Uh, 100, almost 100 years later, when the Mesabi Range began to run dry, a uh, professor at the University of Minnesota built on Edison's technology and actually developed a similar process that was used in the Mesabi Range. So it was a successful technology, but not a successful invention because the price of ore dropped. But Edison took the crushing technology he developed and transformed it into cement manufacturing technology because he was actually selling sand to uh, cement manufacturers. That was what he's earning money on. And then he improves the kiln that's used in cement manufacturing, and that leads to actually overproduction in the industry because it gets adopted by everybody else. So sometimes technology, although it works very efficiently, uh, sometimes doesn't work so well from an industrial standpoint, especially during war when building uh, declines. Um, so these are some of the things that Edison did, and all of this he draws on this experience he had first as a telegraph inventor and then as a, an electric light inventor realizing the role that scientific research, basic and applied research, plays in the process, but also realizing the relationship between that research and the commercial technology he's trying to develop, how users are going to use it, how it's going to be manufactured, what the costs are. These are all things he's concerned with as part of the process of invention. So science plays a role, but all these other things uh, play a role as well, and he replicates this process over and over again with phonograph and motion pictures and electric storage batteries and cement and mining and all of that. So that's the story of Thomas Edison and in a sense what we have is the story of the beginning of modern research and development rather than the story of the last of the lone heroic inventors. Now I'll leave it there. <laughs> And I'll be happy to uh, take questions if anybody has any. Yes? Considering the way modern laboratories are, are constructed financially and the way industry is organized, do you think there's much possibility for an individual to do the kind of thing that Edison did in the lab? Well, you know, Edison himself was pretty unusual. <laughs> Most independent inventors had to rely on other people to market their inventions. They usually found investors that they then sold the patents to, and they might play some role in the company, but there are very few that played as central a role in the innovation process as Edison did. And so in many respects, he's an exception to the history of invention, if you will, rather than a model for others and in many respects, although he became a model that people looked to. There were a few other people in that era who you can and sort of see following in his footsteps. Um, but you know, for the most part, it's, you know, when Edison was a, was a telegraph inventor, it was Western Union, it was Golden Stock, right, that were taking those technologies to market. And that's true of most inventions that were developed, even by the independent inventor working in his you know, uh, garage or whatever in the 19th century. Well, the same thing in the 20th century. Um, you know, it's, it's larger scale economic organizations, corporations of some sort, formed either by individuals or pre-existing corporations that end up being the ones that, that take these things to market. And Edison, what he really does is create a new model for how that inventive process should take place. Yeah. Uh, 
Right. Yes, I mean that literally. Um, and, and this is one of the, actually, this is an interesting aspect of Edison's uh, career that um, is, is sometimes derided. You know, this notion, oh, he just tried everything. Well, in fact, Edison didn't just try everything. Um, if you go out and, and Google a term called Edisonian, you'll find lots of stuff. Um, so what's Edisonian research? It's basically materials or chemical research where you try lots of different, either different combinations of chemicals or you try materials under certain conditions. Um, this is basic to a lot of chemical and material research. Um, people looking at Edison's, you know, efforts, you know, kind of derided as just trying everything until he kind of stumbles upon it. But most of the time when Edison was doing this kind of research, he had very particular parameters that he had set up, right, as to what the materials or the chemicals that he was using, what group he was, he was using, for what purpose he was using it, right? And so it was a very um, focused kind of research. And this is true, I mean, laser research, the development of lasers took place in very much the same way right, in the post-war era that Edison worked on electric lights, for example, a hundred years earlier. So um, this is actually a, uh, not something that should be sneered at, although many um, modern researchers do tend to sneer at it. They think that you should be able to just theoretically figure out what the result is going to be, but oftentimes chemicals and materials don't always operate exactly how theory describes them, and oftentimes scientific theory oversimplifies what the real world actually looks like in order to create basic laws, but those laws uh, don't take into account other factors that come into play when you're trying to use materials and chemicals in a technological sense, right, as opposed to purely scientific sense. And so this is a really in interesting, important distinction between scientific and technical research uh, as well. Yeah. Well, he actually abandoned Menlo Park by um, 1883 because most of the research was actually taking place in the manufacturing plants. There were three plants in New York and the lamp factory in East Newark, or what's now Harrison. Um, he, his first wife dies in 1884. He remarries in 1886, and before he gets married, he, and his, he gives his wife a choice. He, we can either live in the country or we can live in the city. She likes the place in the country. At Llewellyn Park, uh, there's a uh, very fancy home that's been built by this fellow named Petter who had embezzled money from the company he worked for, Constable and Company. And Edison got it for a swan song, basically. And it's a very nice home. You can go see it, Glenmont. Um, that's why he ended up there. And then he decided to build a new laboratory. And so at that time, the land wasn't as expensive as it might subsequently become either that he was building. Yeah. Oh. Yes. That's a really good question. Um, Edison missed alternating current for one principal reason. Um, for, for, well, no, actually not money. Actually, I would say there are, there are basically three reasons why. Um, first of all, of course, the DC system was his, right? So he was invested in it both personally and financially. Um, he also probably... One of the things about Edison is, and the same thing happens with the sound recording industry and the motion picture industry, Edison is very good at innovating new technology, but as the industry matures, he doesn't tend to understand how it changes uh, and make those shifts, in part because of these investments that he has. But with, ele with the electric lighting, something else came into play. Um, when Edison was installing DC central stations, those arc light systems, for street lighting were high voltage AC systems. And they were strung overhead along with telegraph and telephone wires. And occasionally a poor lineman working for the telegraph or telephone company would go up to fix the wire and it had crossed with an arc light and they were electrocuted. Well, one of the people who had seen this happen in Buffalo is a dentist who was on the board of a uh, state, uh, state board that was set up in 1888 in New York to investigate an alternative, a more humane alternative to hanging for the execution of criminals. He comes to Edison and says, 
Would electrocution be an instantaneous and painless way of putting criminals to death? And Edison says yes. And another fellow, Harold P. Brown, who had been one of the people marking electric pens, comes to Edison and says, I want to demonstrate that DC, high voltage DC is safer than high voltage AC. And they begin doing experiments at the West Orange Laboratory, electrocuting stray dogs. Um, I'm dubious about how stray many of them were. Um, and they demonstrate that, in fact, at that time, the systems that were being used, about 2,000 volt systems, that high voltage AC was more dangerous than high voltage DC. And in fact, both Charles Batchelor and Arthur uh, Kennelly, who was um, Edison's primary uh, electrical researcher uh, and ran the, the electrical laboratory, both took accidental shocks from the high voltage DC. Uh, they probably would have both been killed if it had been high voltage AC. Um, one of the things that results from all this research is a law is passed in New York to create electrocution. Uh, Edison is involved in cons consultations about the development of the electric chair. There's a big court case. The fellow who, the first fellow going, who's going to be, poor fellow who's going to be electrocuted said, that's cruel and unusual. They file a suit. Um, the key witness is not anybody who knows that much about the physiology, uh, but in fact, this electrical expert named Thomas Edison. Right? And Edison carries the day because he's the world expert for everybody on anything electrical by this time. Uh, in fact, of course, what happens is New York State doesn't pay for a trained electrician to be involved in this, and they botch the electrocution horribly. Um, and there's a lot of controversy, but ultimately the electric chair becomes a standard way of putting people to death, and this grows out of this contest between AC and DC. But Edison was convinced, firmly convinced, that high voltage was dangerous. And in the 1920s, when the systems are 20,000 volt for distribution, you can still see newspaper interviews with Edison in which he's saying it's too dangerous. Yeah? Given the diversity of his interests mm -hmm. and the way he developed his expertise, is there any other comparable inventor scientist? There are other people who tend to work um, um, along Similar lines in terms of, uh, for example, William Siemens uh, of the Siemens Company, um, or Werner Siemens, I should say. William is his brother who goes to England. Werner Siemens is involved in telegraph, the telephone, the electric lighting industry, but he doesn't make the move into these other things that Edison does. Um, Frank Sprague, who works for Edison in the construction department setting up central stations, goes on and invents well, the first really important motor for electric railways and then later develops uh, elevator technology. Because uh, they're basically railroads going straight up and down. Um, but he doesn't um, develop, you know, move into other areas. This is very uncommon. Now, there are some inventors who do over time. Uh, there are other people who do. In fact, there was an article that I was just sent the link to today about some of these inventors who now have surpassed Edison in terms of the number of U.S. patents. And they have patents in a variety of different areas. Um, none of them, however, is fundamentally important in any one industry as Edison was in three, right? Um, in fact, one could argue four because the telephone transmitter was as central to the telephone as anything else. So there are at least four industries that Edison's technology was central for the commercial success of those technologies, right? Um, there's nobody comparable to that, right? That's what sets Edison apart is that he played such a key role in so many of the technologies of modern life. Thank you, Shu. And then oh, here, thanks, okay. Dr. Rocha, for all of you. Okay. If anybody wants to come up and talk to me, I'll be happy to stick around.